So when we said that we were going to look for this definition of momentum, one of the things we said it must have is that it's conserved in all reference frames. That's OK. Another thing we said it should have is that for small velocities, it should be approximately the same as the Newtonian one, right? Because we know that Newtonian momentum works for small velocities. So we can check that now. Right? If V is much, much less than C, then you get simply that the four vector momentum is approximately equal to M times C Vx Vy Vz. <coughs> in which case the time component is just a constant. It doesn't change. Speed of light is constant. And the x, y, and z components do indeed give you the Newtonian momentum. So that's, again, what we wanted. For small velocities, it reduces to the Newtonian momentum, okay? plus a constant term in the time component. So combining this with the fact that the Lorentz transformation at small velocities is approximately equal to the Galilean transformation, you see that for the Galilean transformation, the Newtonian momentum is conserved, right? which is something that we showed back at the start. Right, so now let me start on the main topic, which is investigating this time component. What is the time component of momentum? Okay, so I'm going to explain this through a series of examples looking at different systems where momentum is conserved. So for the first example, I'm just going to consider a system of particles. I'll only draw three, but it can be more than three, okay? which have some certain masses mi and some speeds vi. So here I've drawn vi with a single arrow. That means it's a three-dimensional velocity, right? That's the normal velocity, vx, vy, vz, not the four vector one. Okay? So I have this system of particles, then in the meantime something happens, so they interact in some way, okay? And some time later, I look at the same system of particles and I found that they've moved around a bit. Okay. So the, I assume that the masses have not changed, but the velocities may have changed. Okay. So, what is the time component of momentum? So, the time component of momentum, I'm going to write like this, PT. So, T here just means it's the time component. So, this is from that equation. It's M times C divided by the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. Okay. Now, if I assume that my things are not going too fast, so they're going slow compared to the speed of light. <clears throat> then again, I can expand the bottom as a Taylor series. So I'll just take the first two terms. So that gives me mc times 1 plus a half v squared over c squared. Okay. And I can write this in the following way. This is equal to 1 over c times mc squared plus a half mv squared. Right? That's, that's just simply rearranging it, taking a factor of c squared outside, and taking the m inside. Okay? So the reason you write it in this way is you see that now we've got two terms. The first term is a constant. First term is a constant, and the second term is what? Kinetic energy, good. <clears throat> so you see, therefore, that in this kind of collision, 
to the first order in v squared over c squared, conservation of pt just means conservation of kinetic energy. Right? This is a constant, so that doesn't change. So conservation of pt means conservation of kinetic energy. <clears throat> so let me write it in a bit, a few more steps. So conservation of pt, this means that the sum upon i of pti is a constant. But since we can write pt in that way, this means that the sum upon i of 1 over c mic squared plus a half micvi squared is a constant. Okay, but the first term is always a constant. So this means sum upon i of a half micvi squared is a constant. And that's conservation of kinetic energy. Right? So that's our first hint about the meaning of the time component of momentum. For this simple system, and at speeds much less than the speed of light, the conservation of PT tells you the conservation of kinetic energy in the system. Okay? So it's got something to do with conservation of energy. That's hopefully clear. But the problem is that it's not true that con kinetic energy is always conserved, right? So collisions in which kinetic energy is conserved are called elastic collisions, but not all collisions are elastic. So for example, if I take my two bodies uh, to be these board rubbers, I can consider the collision where they come together with equal velocities and then they stick in the middle, right? So I can consider a collision like this. So then total momentum is conserved because the, well, the Newtonian momentum is conserved in the x, y, and z directions, right? Because this momentum is minus that momentum, so total is zero. That's okay. But kinetic energy is not conserved, right? Because before the collision, these are moving, they have kinetic energy, but after the collision, they don't have kinetic energy, right? So that's a problem. Kinetic energy, this PT, Conservation of PT says that conservation of kinetic energy, but that's not always true, right? There are systems where kinetic energy is not conserved. So next I want to look at a system like that, okay, a system in which kinetic energy is not conserved. Okay, so this is the example I'm going to look at. Originally I've got two masses, two objects of mass M with opposite velocities, V and minus V. Okay, and then they collide together, and after the collision, I have a single object of mass 2m, which is stationary. Yeah, that's what I'm going to consider. So you can check very easily that the x, y, and z components of momentum are conserved, right? Because they're all zero. So it's plus v minus v. Right? So total momentum is zero in the x, y, and z components, that's okay. But if we look at the time component of momentum, then what's that? So from that formula, it's mc divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And it's the same for both masses, so therefore it's just twice that. And afterwards, you've just got one object of mass 2m. The velocity v is 0, so therefore it's just 2m times c. And it's not conserved. Okay? So that's a problem. <coughs> Okay. 
So the, we run into a problem now, because I, I told you the great thing about this four-vector momentum is that conservation of four-vector momentum is agreed upon by all observers, but it looks like in this very simple example, the time component is not conserved. Right? So what should we do about this? So you might be a bit suspicious about this time component, and you might think, well, okay, maybe the x, y, and z components of momentum are conserved, but the time component is not conserved. Right? So maybe we can just ignore the time component and then treat the other three, right? which are conserved. That doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is when you go into a different reference frame, the Lorentz transformation mixes up the time and space components of momentum. Right? Because p prime is equal to L of u times p, right? it is a four vector, that means, for example, the x component of momentum in the prime frame is equal to gamma times the x component of momentum in the original frame minus u over c times the x times the t component of momentum in the original frame. And that's the Lorentz transformation of the, of the x component. Now, if we said that the x, y, and z components are conserved, but this one is not, then we have a problem. Because then for this observer, this one will also not be conserved. Right? Because it includes the, the t component here. So that's a no-go, right? We either have everything is conserved, or we have nothing is conserved. Right? You can't say this is component is conserved, but that one's not. That doesn't work. Okay? So a second negative response is to abandon conservation of momentum, to say, okay, forget about it, it's not possible. Momentum is not conserved in special relativity. But again, also, that, that's a bad response, because we know, well, at least we should try to save the, co the concept, right? Because we know that momentum is a very useful concept in Newtonian physics. And indeed, it can be saved. And the way to save it is to say that actually, in this collision, the mass after the collision is not 2m. Right? I can get conservation of the time component of momentum if I assume that after the collision, the mass here is increased. So we can conservation of Pt if we assume that the mass after the collision is not equal to 2m, but is equal to m prime, which is equal to 2m divided by the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. So if you assume that the mass is not 2m, but is increased again by the gamma factor, then you see that you would, in that case, get conservation. Right? Then the mass after and the mass before will be the same. Everything's conserved. So what is this? So again, for small velocities, this is true. And for small velocities, this is 2m. And again, you expand the thing on the bottom. 1 plus half b squared over c squared, which is 2m plus a half times 2m <coughs> um, okay, let me write this. 2m plus 2 times a half m b squared over c squared. <clears throat> so what does that tell you? That tells you that the mass must be increased by an amount delta m, which is equal to m prime minus 2m, which is approximately equal to this term. And this term is simply the kinetic energy that was lost in the collision, right? 
So this one has kinetic energy a half mv squared. So does this one. So 2 times a half mv squared is the kinetic energy lost in the collision divided by c squared. Okay? <coughs> kinetic energy lost in the collision <coughs> divided by c squared. But we know that total energy is conserved, so if kinetic energy is lost, then we must have created another kind of energy. And you can guess what this is, or, well, you know what this is. If I keep doing this collision, right, then these things will get hot, right? So what's happened is that the kinetic energy is being converted into heat energy, right? And what the equation says, then, is that the gain in the mass is equal to the gain in heat energy divided by c squared. So this is a very weird idea. But in order, in order to save conservation of momentum here, we have to assume that this is true. We have to assume that colliding things will increase the mass of the object that is created, okay? So the first thing to know is that sounds a bit crazy, right? So let's do an example. Let's suppose that the mass of these bodies is one kilogram, and let's suppose that the velocity of these bodies is about 10 meters per second, okay? So that's a reasonable collision that you can simulate on Earth, right, in a lab. Then in this case, delta m is equal to mv squared over c squared. And this is approximately 1 times 10 to the minus, that's 100, 9 times 10 to the 16, so minus 15 kilograms. So the first thing to note is that Although this idea sounds crazy, in a normal Earth laboratory environment, you would never notice it, okay? Because the changes in mass you will produce are unmeasurable, right? Compared to an initial mass of one kilogram, we've increased mass by 10 to the minus 15 kilograms, which, you know, you basically can't measure. So, although this idea sounds crazy, it might be true. Because in the kind of experiments we do, you would never notice this usually. Because it, it's, a, it's a tiny effect. And it only becomes significant, again, when velocities approach the speed of light. Okay. A second thing to note is that it doesn't have to be heat energy. Right? I could do the same collision, but I could put some springs on the masses, okay? So then when the masses collide, the energy will be stored in the spring. Okay? And again, by the same reasoning, that should also increase the mass. I could use some electrical circuitry, right? So I could do something with magnets and coils. So when these things collide, I generate an electric current, okay? And again, in that case, the kinetic energy has been converted into electrical energy, and again, by the same argument, the mass must increase by the gain in electrical energy. Okay? So it's not something special about heat. Any form of energy which I give to this mass must increase the mass by this amount okay? in order to be consistent with this conservation of time component of momentum. So, okay, number two, so it doesn't have to be heat energy. So in order to have conservation of time component of momentum, <coughs> Any energy
Okay, so we talked about heat, talked about um, string potential energy, talked about electrical energy. So, any kind of energy given to a body must increase the mass of the body by an amount, delta m, which is equal to the change in energy, the amount of energy you give to the body, divided by c squared. Okay. And hopefully now you can see where this is going. This is the, the famous e equals mc squared formula, right? That, that's where it comes from and that's its meaning. So this is the meaning of the famous formula E equals mc squared. That's what it means. If you give energy to a body, you must increase its mass by, by this factor, change in energy over c squared. Why is that true? Well, in special relativity, that's the only way you can get a momentum vector which is conserved. So if, if you want to have the concept of momentum in special relativity and you want it to be conserved according to all observers, then you have no choice. This must be true. So that's where it comes from. Right. So you can consider the same process in reverse. So inst instead of considering these two masses coming together and colliding and gaining in energy, you can consider the reverse process where energy is created and these things fly away. Okay? So you have this, and then some of the mass energy is converted into kinetic energy, which then pushes the, the bodies apart. Okay? And this is basically an explosion. Right? So, so this is Usually this equation is associated with kind of atomic bombs and things, okay? Which is the same process that we've considered, but in the opposite direction. Okay, so in reverse, it looks something like this. You have a body of mass m, okay? And then it explodes. Bang. Okay? And then after the explosion, you gather up all of the bits that were left over, if you can find them, which you probably can't, okay? So after the explosion, you've got lots of bits, and if you measure the total mass here, you will find that it's less, okay? And the energy of the explosion is given by the change in mass, so that's m minus m prime times c squared. So it's exactly the same thing, but just in the opposite order. So this explains the potential of things like atomic bombs, because it was noticed um, at the start of the 20th century that when certain elements underwent radioactive decay, things like uranium, the mass of the things that were left over was less than the mass of the things that you started with. Okay? And according to this equation, that means then that's converted into energy. Okay, so if you can get a chain reaction of such explosions, then you can produce a lot of energy. Which is the idea behind the atomic bomb. I mean, it's a bit unfair to say that this equation allowed the atomic bomb to be made. That's not really true, right? Because you can experimentally just measure that energy is generated. You don't need to know this equation in order to be able to build an atomic bomb. Right? Um, but you know, in, in popular imagination, it's become associated with that effect in that way. 